Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, January 11th, 2024. And this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. If, you want, if you're watching on YouTube, welcome to. I broadcast on Thursdays at 6 p.m. Central, 7 Eastern. All right, what are we talk about? Well, current market conditions, obviously. I'll have a plethora to say about that. Your questions on trading, your favorite stock and crypto picks, hang on to those till we get to the live charts so I, I can see what, what's been asked about. And I'm going to continue my series on things I wish somebody would have told me a long time ago. And this is going to be an ongoing thing. And and this is getting huge. I just keep adding and adding and adding to it. And uh, we'll cover a few of those this week. And we'll get back to it a little bit more heavily next week. And the reason is I have some live setups I want to show you that are still viable. And then we've got a lot of questions this week. Uh, one on adding to positions and one on exiting on signals with stops. And then I did have uh, one, I think it was yesterday afternoon there was a new crypto trade i want to show you and then we could be back to going buying stuff that goes up and, and that'll make a lot of sense in just one minute and we will get to the live crypto charts too toward the end of the presentation see if we can find some opportunities if you want to attend these live davelander.com slash webinar you could reach me on youtube at at dave landry and on tiktok i'm trend following moron on x i am t following moron if you need to reach me need uh, personally, DaveLander.com slash contact. And I do have a Facebook group, but that's members only. You have to be a gold member, at least, of my website. There was a disclaimer screen. As you know, you could lose money trading. Or, as I often sum it up, all predictions about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right, let's talk about the mystery charts and the methodology in action. This week, there's no mystery charts. I'm going to show you just a couple of trades that aren't really working out so great yet that they still look pretty good as a possible new setup. And that's why I'm showing them to you. Uh, the first one is RYTM, triggered a few days ago. And those are the parameters down below. I'll show you how to get those in just one second. The entry was here, the initial profit target was up here, and the stop was right here. If you're looking to take this as a new trade, I would look to enter above this pivot point and I'd keep the stop right around where it is. So that still looks pretty good. Let's go back to that one just for one second. This is a Landry Light pullback. Landry Light is simply lows are greater than the moving average. And that's illustrated down below. I like to call my indicators illustrators, as you may know, because they don't indicate anything. Nobody has an indicator, or no one has an indicator, should say, that indicates anything. They illustrate what's actually going on in the chart. And make sure you always look at the chart. And as I'm looking at this particular stock, if you look back here, notice we had nice Landry light, okay? And this Landry light continued for a long time, and that's just lows are greater than the EMA. And that usually suggests that the market's in a trend. However, you always need to look at the chart, right? So yeah, this thing really took off, but then from this point here all the way to here, even though you had all this Landry light in there, this market had definitely lost a lot of steam. So don't just look at your indicator, make sure you, or see your indicator as an illustrator and make sure you confirm with the what's happening in the underlying chart. When I scan at night, I go through upwards of 2000, but right now it's probably about somewhere between 1200, 1500 charts a night. And um, when I'm going through those, I use, use an absolute blank chart, no indicators whatsoever. Some of these indicators do help in teaching. And like I said, as illustrators, they kind of help you to see what's already in the chart. So not a huge fan of indicators, but I do use the occasional moving average and Landry Light. And also, you could use these things, obviously, to help you scan. So anyway, this is a Landry Light pullback. And for that pattern, I'm looking for, I think in the layman's guide to trading stocks, I said 10 days, but ideally you want about 20 days. That means the stocks has been, tr has been trading, uh, moving higher at least for a month. And then also, you're looking for the stock to pull back to the moving average. Now, I trade different types of pullbacks, so I'll show you one in one second that does not come all the way back to the moving average but it was it was also a pullback or some other pattern anyway so this is still set up it hasn't taken off obviously yet and hopefully yet is a keyword in that sentence here's another one and this is straight from my trading service you can see the entry the stop and the initial profit target and let's take a look at that chart entry is there the ipt is up here 
and then the stop is down here. So once again, you can see we've got nice Landry light. We have persistency, meaning that the stock tends to go up day after day after day. And we also have a bit of acceleration higher in here before it pulled back. Now, again, in this case, it didn't get all the way back to the EMA, but it looked pretty good as just kind of a generic pullback. In fact, if you were going to use uh, the 20 EMA, which I recommended in the layman's guide to trading stocks, then this would have actually been a Landry Light pullback because that 20 EMA would have been a little bit higher. Anyway, so this is still a viable setup. And like the other one, it uh, it did fake out on us, but above this fake out right here would be your new entry. If you want to see these, davelander.com slash archives. I noticed I have a gap recently, and I'll work to fill those in as time allows. Uh, but the most recent ones, including these trades here, I put up a little while ago. So you can go to that link and find out more about that. And if you just want to watch it live and participate live, then you can get the live signals by going to davelander.com slash trading service. And that'll also give you access to the members area and tons and tons of courses. Now, I haven't checked all the courses, but today somebody showed me that they had completed everything. And that's the first person to actually show me that. So I was pretty impressed with that. Anyway, I digress. Letters, we do get letters. So I received this letter here and Hal's in our Facebook group and he was looking to get long some additional shares of a stock that we're already long. Now I'm not gonna read all these things to you. I just wanna kind of give you a little bit of a thumbnail. And if you wanna hit pause, obviously later, you can read these on your own or print them off or whatever the case may be. But he brought up a lot of interesting points about add-ons and my the old me would just say, let's say you're long 400 shares, okay? And you flipped out 200 shares at the initial profit target. Then when the stock sets up again, maybe put those 200 shares back on on a swing trade. But I began to flesh out a lot of things today with those add-on trades. And I'll share some of that with you. But basically how I was asking like, okay, where does my stop need to be? It can't be way down where it would be with the trend following portion. And this is my long winded answer here. You can see I kind of kind of went on and on. I went a bit of a diatribe, but there's a lot, there's a lot in here. And part of what I was saying is that your margin is going to be much, much, much higher as the stock moves in your favor. So maybe we'll just pop back and forth a couple of times. So here's here's the setup, the original setup. And again, this and I actually went to my own archives to pick these up, but you can see. KNF, it was an IPO first pullback, 300 shares, round numbers. That's per 100K at 45.20, stop at 38.50. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about stop distance in just a few minutes. So that might make a little more sense too. But anyway, so the trigger was, let's get the trigger in here. The trigger was there and it was at 40 something dollars a share the initial profit target was there so 150 shares were flipped out at that ipt and then at that point in time you move your stop up to break even now you might move it a little bit as it moves in your favor and by looking at the archives you'll actually see when i bump the stops and how i bump the stops to kind of give you a feel for how i do that and how i believe it should be done to make the transition from the shorter term trader to the longer term trader now you can see over here, it's pulled back to the EMA. This is Landry Light pullback and it's set up and poised to make a new leg higher. So what Hal's saying is, he was asking questions about adding on to the trade. So your add on trade would be around 65, maybe a little bit of wiggle room, but just to keep the math easy, any, any, uh, any trade above this pivot high would be the new trigger, okay? So again, and I didn't see his share size, but the per 100K share size is 300. So you have 150 shares on here. Now, if you were going to put back on 150 shares, the one issue would be your margin would be about 44% higher because the stock price is much, much higher. You have a 60 something handle as opposed to a 40 something handle. So the stock is much more expensive. So you wouldn't want to put on a full half position, if that makes sense. What you'd want to do is dial it down a little bit because you are putting a lot of risk up. Now, as I was discussing this in Facebook, I got to thinking that the, the new me, I haven't done any add-on trades in a while, but the new me 
and I don't know how long ago I started thinking about this, maybe five years ago, but I, I began to realize that pure short-term trading is is not not the way to go. You can only predict the short term. So yeah, I'm a huge short-term trader in that I'm a swing trader, but the real money is in these longer term trends as you see here. So you've got your IPT out, that's a short term trade, but then months and months and months pass and you this is where you're starting to actually make some real money. In fact, this is the only big winner left in the portfolio and it triggered before the market tanked. So you might've gotten shaken out if you're like, well, the market's tanking, I better get out of everything. But longer term, the best thing to do is to stick with your positions until you're stopped out. Now I digressed a bit there, but it is kind of cool that this triggered way back last summer. I was a little amazed myself when I grabbed this slide 10 seconds ago, <laughs> putting together my show at the last minute I threw this one in and I had to go all the way back to uh, July to find, find out when I recommended the stock. So the point I was making about the short term versus long term term is, if you're a short-term trader, as a general statement, the market can only move so far, so your profits are gonna be generally limited. Unfortunately, bad things can still happen. So you could end up with a black swan event where your stock gets torpedoed and loses half its value overnight. Now, that can actually can actually happen. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> that can happen, obviously, in a longer-term trade, but in a longer term trade, you have the potential to make 300, 400, and 500 percent. I'll show you one that I think was up over 500 percent. By the time we got stopped out, uh, we got stopped out closer to 300 percent, but there were some dividends and such, so it, it did help out. But anyway, the point is so I'm not as excited about add on trades as I used to be. I'll still do them, but one of my concerns is that. If you do an add-on, something bad can still happen. And an add-on trade, you're flipping out the whole trade. At least that's how I used to teach doing it. And now I would recommend going with a smaller, much smaller trade size, okay? So in a case like this, your absolute maximum, I think, should be 100 shares versus 150, and then maybe even a smaller share size than that. And that's per 100K. And that'll make sense when you look at some of the archives. You'll see how the portfolio works, the model portfolio, that is. So... The bottom line is, and I know we talked a lot about a lot of different things, and I went through, and if you go back to the slide here, I talked about margin and all this other stuff, and you can see it went on and on and on, and something very simple now becomes something much more complex, and I talked a little bit about the endowment theory, and that means that once you own something for a while, you become somewhat attached to it, especially in a case like this, where you made some really good money on it, okay? So there's a lot to think about, and I'm not going to bore you and read all this to you tonight, but it, it, trading is a lot more complicated than it seems on the surface. And I think that's one of the things eventually I'm going to get to, that it's harder than it looks. And that's one of the things that I wish somebody would have told me a long time ago, because it sure does look pretty easy <laughs> when you look at it. Anyway, so for the add-on trade, the bottom line is uh, go with a smaller share size because you're gonna to have to put up a lot more margin. And also there's a risk of that pure short-term trade. Now, what you might consider, let's just use the 100 shares for round numbers, but let's say you did 100 shares, which is probably too many, but let's say you did 100, then maybe you flip out 50 at that new swing trade initial profit target, okay? Kind of like we did last time back here in on all our trades, and then hold on to 50, but treat that 50 like a swing trade with a tighter stop. And then as that market moves in your favor, you still have your longer term stop way down here, the swing trade stop up here, and slowly let that open up. And eventually you might be able to get it down to that longer term stop. So now you've got the original position with the longer term stop and your new position that you flipped out with the longer term stop in place. So hopefully that'll make sense. And if not, read that thing that I just put up there. And then uh, let me know if you have any questions from there. All right, so I got your email saying, hey Dave, enjoy your books and videos, love the bow tie method. Not sure when to exit the trade. Should I exit when the bow tie flips negative or just let the trailing stop do its job? Thanks for your input. And so we did cross some emails here, so hopefully it'll make sense. But I basically said to that, exit when stopped out, 
if you've been loosening the stop over time in a longer term position, it's, then it's possible that the bow ties can flip down and the stop is still a ways away. I have an example of that in one second. On the flip side, early in the position, you could get stopped out before they flip down. Moving averages obviously have lag to them. So let's say your stop is right here and you, you're waiting for the moving averages to flip down. Well, they might not flip down until you're way down here and then you're a hurt and pop, okay? So, and then on the flip side, if the moving averages are flipping down and you're a longer term trend, you stop might be a long, long ways away. So it says, thanks again for your help. When the longer running trades, I assume that makes sense to exit on the crossovers if they appear before the trailing stop. So my answer to that was not necessarily, if you're in longer term trend following mode, if you're in a longer term, if you're, if you're in long-term trend mode and even longer-term trend mode, then you might have several crossovers suggesting the minor trend has turned, but the major trend is still in place. We stayed in ARLP forever. That's when that came to mind, a uh, year and a half or maybe two years, and it had made downside crossovers. So here was the original trade. Downtrend profit water is illustrated here in red. And... My apologies, to everybody that's here from GoToWebinar. I think you 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 understand the bow ties, but uh, it's ten simple, twenty exponential, thirty exponential. If I don't explain it, I'll get a plethora of questions. And there it is, right there. It's just illustrated in red, and this just counts the number of bars. It is not the magnitude, but this is very useful because it'll show you how long that trend has been intact. And you can see they flipped over to the upside. And that's a bow tie setup. And we got in this position on a pullback. So the uptrend proper order in green, 10 greater than 20, greater than 30. And you can see on this chart, you had 41 days since that bow tie flipped into uptrend proper order. So downtrend proper order, you can see the market mostly worked its way lower. And then uptrend proper order, the most the market mostly worked its way higher. Now if we go back here, you can see if you squint your eyes, this is where we got into this trade, and this is where we got stopped out of the trade. And obviously, when we got into it, we had uptrend proper order, but then look what happened. We had downtrend proper order there, 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 if you squint your eyes, there. And then finally, we did stop out in a downtrend proper order. So his question was, do you get out when it crosses back down? And once you've gotten your initial profit target out and you're free rolling, so to speak, on the remainder and you're trailing that stop, and you've let it loosen up enough to ride out some of these longer term corrections and you're in longer term trend following mode. And that's where the money is, by the way. Then I wouldn't exit on a signal or use signal based exits such as the bow tie crossover. I would just honor your stop and exit on the stop. So here's what the trailing stop looked like. This isn't exactly the scale. I used to go through day by day and put every little tick, and that's just a lot of work. But if you had the patience, you could go and look at the archives and see how I moved that over time. But anyway, it's fairly uh, accurate representation. So as the market moves in your favor, you bring the stop higher, and then once you hit the initial profit target, you bring the stop even higher. You do that intraday when you hit the initial profit target. So day over day, you adjust it based on the closing price, up or down, right? So if the stock closes up, you might bump that stop a little bit. If it hits the IPT intraday, even if it comes right back in, you bring your stop up to break even. But anyway, so that's what the trailing stop looks like. When the market is not making new highs like it did right here you stop trailing your stop higher obviously until and unless it starts making new highs new equity highs from where you got in the other thing to remember with a moving average because the way it catches up to price that moving average is going to keep moving even if price has gone flat so you could get crossovers when you have like the so-called dead money that we talked about a lot last week when we were talking about crypto. So I recommend exiting markets, unless you're following a mechanical system, something like the TFM 10% system, I would recommend exiting markets 
when you're stopped out and not so much on signals. Now, a few weeks ago, I woke up thinking and I wrote a few pages on things I wish people would have told me many, many years ago. In fact, a lot of what I do, thinking back over the last, I don't know how many years I've been a public figure doing this, but it's 20 something years or whatever. And everything I do is like, thinking about that person I was 30 years ago when I didn't know a darn thing or thought I'd do something and I didn't know what I didn't know. And I'm going to cover that in one second too. But the bottom line is these are things that I wish somebody would have told me and it's growing and growing and growing by the day. So we might be on this for a while. And here, here were my original notes and there was just 20 of them. And I thought that'd be a good way to um, do a series. But every morning I wake up and add two or three new ones to this list when I do my morning writing. So we're going to be on this for a while, and I think it's I think it's a great series. And, and again, everything I do is based on the fact that I wish somebody would have told me these things a long time ago. One of the biggest things is there's nothing to fear in the market. And believe me, today there was a lot of fear in me. I dropped a lot of f bombs. I cussed and I fussed and and I was a little shaken by the markets, okay? But the bottom line is nothing to fear. And the way I kind of prove that is I ask people, how did they handle, did, did it stress them out? Did the, did the cocoa bear market stress you out? We had this horrible bear market of cocoa. And I ask this, especially if I'm speaking in person, well, before COVID, I spoke in person a lot more than now. But the the, the thing is, not one person in the audience or even in these online presentations has raised their hand because they weren't in Coco. They didn't have a dog in the fight, so it doesn't matter. So the fear is created within. So this is what that Coco bear market looked like. And you can see this market absolutely imploded. And I picked Coco because Coco tends to be a little thinner market. And it had a really nice bear market when I first started this line of reasoning. And it just made a lot of sense. So this market did not create any fear in you. In fact, you probably didn't even know there was a bear market. But when your head's in the washing machine and you're in a position that's going against you, you know, you're in, you're in Meyer today and you come in and you're up three, four bucks and you're feeling like a genius and you're a little bummed out because you're not quite to the profit target. And boy, that's a lot of money to evaporate. And by the end of the day, you're down three bucks or so. So that created a lot of stress in me, even though it's just doing what it does. Now, you get a lot of good out of Mark Douglas, and he does talk a lot about how fear is created within, especially in trading in the zone. If you go to davelander.com slash books dash two dash read, you can see a list of books that I recommend you read. And he said, what you fear is not the markets, but rather your inability to do what you need to do when you need to do it without hesitation. Now, once you start quoting, I don't know what's wrong with my mouth tonight, quoting Mark, it's kind of hard to stop. There's a psychological gap between those who have truly accepted risk. If you could put on a trade without hesitation and take it off without emotional discomfort, then you have accepted the risk. Good luck. but as you'll see in just a second, if you're trading at a smaller size, it makes it easier and easier to accept that risk. Now, speaking of risk, the risk is not what you're comfortable with. It is what it is. And you have to accept it or risk being left, left behind. Now, over the years, I've had many, 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 many clients tell me, in some cases, like I recommend a, a stock with a 30% stop. Now, that sounds crazy. That sounds ludicrous. Even ludicrous would say that's ludicrous. But if that's what it calls for, if this stock moves around 20 30% over a very short period of time, and we're trying to withstand that short-term volatility, then you're going to need a 30-something percent stop. And it's like 30-something percent stop. I can't use no 30-something percent stop. And then as they said in Caddyshack, then you don't get no coca. I haven't rewatched it. I was told not to rewatch it because the funny movie I remember really wasn't that funny. But anyway, 
Now, some people will, because they won't, don't want to risk that 30%, they'll risk 10%, okay? Well, if that stock requires a 30% stop, you're three times more likely, statistically, to get stopped out of that stock. And I have fixed a lot of people, so to speak, by for free. I don't, I don't make anything, I didn't make anything off of it, but I fixed a lot of people who were desperate by telling them, hey, loosen your stops a little bit, okay? Trade, bump your share that size down accordingly, but loosen your stops a bit. Now, one column that I added to the, the service in fairly recent times was this initial risk, okay? And people like to see, you know, how much was the original risk? Now, that K&F we just talked about, that was only 15%. By the way, there's a popular methodology that says you could risk, you should risk no more than 8% on a position. Well, that's like saying, and I know I've said this a thousand times, well, that's like saying I should wear a medium-sized shirt, something my fat ass hasn't done in 50 years. <laughs> Do that math in my head, probably 50 something years. But anyway, these are the stops that they call for. Remember, I was just talking about Myra, and I said 30%. Well, I was close, it's 28%. That uh, PRCH trade I mentioned earlier was 30%. Now, notice that we are adjusting the share sizes based on the price of the stock and the risk, okay? The point risk, okay? So this is the percent risk, obviously. And then your point risk is right here, okay? So we're taking a hypothetical $100,000 account and we're risking 2% if stopped out on every trade, okay? So that's $2,000 per trade. And believe me, that's plenty, okay? That's a lot more than I wanna risk, right? But 2% seems to be the magical number. You can make good money at 2% and if you get whacked a bit, it, it hurts, okay? But it's not it's not going to kill you, provided that your stock selection is there, provided the markets are there. I know a lot of uh, ifs in that sentence, but you can see that different stocks require a different type of stop, and then we adjust the share size down accordingly. So hopefully, a word you should never use this business, but hopefully, the worst we do is a two thousand dollar per hundred k or two percent loss overall and then in a lot of cases the position will move in our favor so that loss comes off a little bit okay now the last trade that stopped out and i knew it had a wide stop so i wanted to show you this you can see it had a 29 percent stop and it stopped out at a 48 percent gain on the second loaf and if you take a look at this k and f it was only 15 percent, and you can see 42 percent gain knock on wood so far so you have to be willing to risk more on a percent base basis when the stock calls for it and if you take a look at like that alrp which had a pretty wide stop on it that stop especially once you look at a longer term chart it's only that far away okay on the chart itself and even on a shorter term chart the stop is pretty close go in after this is over, obviously, and rewatch the entries and the stops that I used on those trades, RYTM and the, what's, what was the other one? Oh, uh, PRCH, okay? Go in and look at those stops, and they're really not that far away from the stock price. But for some reason, people get caught up in this percent risk thing. And I would urge you to forget about percent risk risk whatever it calls for. Now, oh, here's the ARLP, I forgot about that. I forgot I had it in here. So this was a 20% stop. And I don't recall anyone telling me they didn't trade it because of the 20% stop. I do remember a few stocks that were like in the 30% range and people said, there's no way I'm gonna do that. And they missed, unfortunately, some really, really, really good winners. Now, there was a few stinkers thrown in, don't get me wrong. Sometimes we have losses. In fact, we have a lot of losses, as you can see, in the open portfolio. But longer term, things tend to work out. We catch one or two or three or four of these big trends over time, and it pays for everything. One or two big trends a year is all you really need to pay for your year. And you can see down here, so this was uh, 2018, uh, let's just say $20,000 round numbers on a hypothetical 100K account. So that's 20%. Your account made 20% just with that one trade. Now, these don't come along every day, 
And the way we get to these is we chip away, chip away, chip away, chip away. And some of these losers will maybe stop out. I don't want to say they will stop out. I don't want to be negative. Uh, who was it? Uh, right? I was going to be a pessimist, but I figured it wouldn't work out. <laughs> but obviously, some of these will stop out. They'll all stop out eventually. And we, we'll just keep building our team, building our team of, of good stocks. And eventually, we'll have a fantastic looking portfolio that's going to just look absolutely amazing. And there's an ebb and flow. It's like we had mostly winners not too long ago. Now we're putting on some new positions and it, it comes and goes with the territory. All right. The other thing is you don't know what you don't know. And it's funny. Every day I learn something new about the markets and it's like, oh, wow, I can't believe I didn't know that. Or just, just my reaction to things. And there's so many things that you don't know. And the one of these, I think it's like way down, further down, but basically it said if you're struggling, good. And the reason I put that in there is because when you think it's easy, when you think you've got it figured out, that's right before you're getting ready to blow up. I can almost guarantee, I can all but guarantee that. So you don't know what you don't know. And you'll only be smarter in the future. That I can guarantee. When you go back, and if you've been trading for a while, when you go back and look at some of your trades, you're going to think, what in the hell was I thinking? And if you were trading smaller back then, you would have lost a lot less money. And the bottom line is you have to get the reps in. And if you blow up while you're getting the reps in, then you'll never become a successful trader. And I've met some people recently and they tried prop firms and it's like they're, they're leveraging and they're doing full size E minis and all this other stuff. And it's like, uh, good luck with that. And the prop firms make it pretty easy for you to, to blow up, so to speak. At least they kick you out and you have to put up more money and, and uh, rinse and repeat. It almost seems like they want you to blow up, but that's a, that's a story for another conversation. But if these gentlemen instead would have maybe traded one micro account each day with five dollars a point risk or even something maybe just a few shares of spy or something like that or whatever the case may be to get a feel for the trading to get the reps in to not lose a lot of money then they would be much better off and then the other thing too which needs to be one of these these um things that i didn't know is your early success or failure does not predict longer term success in fact in a lot of ways and i think uh I might be kind of uh, hinting around with some of the things that Eckert has said, but let me just say it in my words. If you're, let's say you're real successful early on, you think you have it all figured out, well, then you don't know what you don't know. And I received an email from from a gentleman I had met locally a while back and, and he started trading crypto and he started looking at a lot of my stuff. And then he emails me and says, hey, Dave, I'm up 40% my first month. Is that, what I, is that what I could expect? And I forget the exact math, but I think you're a billionaire within five years. Don't quote me on that, but it doesn't take that many iterations. Within a few years, you're a multimillionaire if you're making 40% a month with the compounding. And I don't know how he's done lately, but I think since then, he's hasn't done quite as well. <laughs> and I think that goes without saying. So trade at a much smaller size than you think. If you're profitable overall and over time, now I say over time because like the aforementioned gentleman, yeah, you might have made 40% in one month, but that doesn't mean you can do that every month. And if you could, you would be a billionaire and I forget how many iterations, but it's, it's uh, I've got a spreadsheet somewhere, but it's within like five years, you're a billionaire. Cause let's say once you hit a million, well then you're making 400,000 a month. And then at 1.4 billion dollars the next month, you're going to make What's that? Oh, I can't do that math in my head. <laughs> you know, another 400,000 plus another 200,000. Now you're over 2 million and then and so on and so forth. And once you're in 10 million, what's that? 4 million a month. So that's a little absurd, obviously, and a little unrealistic. But if you're profitable overall and over time, not just a, a few months here and there, if you live through a few bull and bear market cycles and survive, with reasonable losses and not just a one hit wonder. Let's say you knock it out of the park or something, make a lot of money. I had a friend of mine made a million dollars in in one stock and he thought he was a genius, but he also blew up shortly thereafter. And it was very, 
painful thing to watch. And he actually moved in with me for a while because he was homeless. But that's a whole nother story. That's a two drink minimum story. He had more than two drinks. He's no longer with us. <laughs> but anyway, make sure he's just not like a one hit wonder, either either one stock that you hit on or maybe you hit a good period of time and you made a little money or a lot of money over a short period of time so but if you could make a little money consistently and keep your losses in check and do everything in a conceptually correct manner and prove yourself that you could do it then you could slowly up your size and up your game over time so the bottom line is just trade at a ridiculously small size until you get the reps in, until your psychology is there. If you're trading at the, this one gentleman who was with the prop firm, he was trying to pay his rent. And uh, he's a younger guy. He's still in college. And he, he was trying to pay his rent through his S&P trading. And he was using a prop firm because he didn't have the margin to put up. And so that was kind of a recipe for disaster. And I didn't want to, I was rooting for him, but I didn't want to tell him the reality is it's probably not going to work. He found that out, out on his own. All right, let's shift gears real quick. I want to show you buying things that go up in crypto. Or I should say the fine art of buying stuff that goes up. Now, when the crypto or the altcoins, or I, I still call them shit coins because <laughs> I think it's important not to get attached to these things because most of them are bogus and most of them will probably go to zero. Whenever I start talking about crypto, people want to attack me. It's like, no, 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 no. Just, I'm a trader, okay? So I'm going to get out the way when things get ugly. But I will go in and out and and, and trade these things. And I, I saw someone earlier today. I would never throw anybody under the bus. But they're talking about how this is the absolute top of Bitcoin. And it's going to go down 80%. And today's the day of the top. Well, maybe today's the day. But predict early and often is what I say. And the great thing about crypto is everybody or most everybody is still poo-pooing it. And those are your absolute best markets. And then one of the things that I want to get into a little more details in upcoming presentations on the, on this this theme I've been on about what you don't know and, and things I wish you knew is that markets are emotional and so are you. And the more emotional a market is, and crypto certainly qualifies, the better the inefficiency is and the better moves that it can make. And if you look at some of those stocks that I show in these presentations, or most of them, they all, or all of them, I should, I should say, all have the potential to make um, these huge inefficient moves. But anyway, I just want to show you this one real quick. This was, I think, yesterday. I cut off my date. Yeah, the 10th, okay? And it was just something I saw. And it, it this is on part of the excitement, I guess, of all this ETF stuff. And I don't even know what this this does. And maybe some people thought they were buying Ethereum by buying this. Hey, Ethereum's only 17 bucks. I think I'll buy some. And it was just going up, so I bought it. Now, when the whole market is in a rip-roaring uptrend and everything is going straight up, then you can buy things that are going up, okay? Now, in stocks, this doesn't happen that often, but one of the things I was talking about yesterday in the Daily Five is we go from 1999 to 2000 back and forth again, okay? 1999, stocks were going straight up. It was a wonderful time to be alive. 2000, we had a huge bear market, obviously. NASDAQ lost half of its value, then it lost half of its value again. Yeah, it turns out to, I forget the exact math on that, but I think it was 70 something percent. That's how ugly that bear market was. But sometimes you can play the relative strength game. And I know I kind of beat the dead horse on this, but I have one client back when things were blowing and going, not lately, but he told me that twice. He was using a little app on his phone, just buying the strongest stocks in my Landry list, which I publish every day, and flipping in and out of them, kind of like, I guess, day trading them. And he said twice he's had two good runs where he was able to pull enough money out of the market to put down payments on two commercial properties. So that's pretty exciting. But that doesn't happen every day. I wish it did. I guess if it did, you'd never see my fat ass again. Anyway, entered here. The IPT was 20%. So in this case... Right now, crypto, as I've been saying, I just been using 20% as, a, as an IPT. Uh, technically, I probably should be doing a little bit more analysis and studying and, and, and figuring out what percentage that IPT should be. But right now, I put in a limit order to sell half at the IPT 
as soon as I put on my trade. And now I will use alerts to tell me if I'm if uh, the, the position is going in my favor, and I'll use a little discretion to get out. When you're trading this relative strength game, let's say you get in this one and then you come back and it comes back in, and there's other crypto pairs that look really good, then I will actually flip out of of the trade early without stopped out, so to, without being stopped out, so to speak. But anyway, I'm kind of doing nickels and dimes in the crypto. It's a lot of fun. Uh, it's also quite a dangerous market, but that's what makes it work. So let's hop into the live crypto charts, and then we'll open it up for questions, and then we'll get the stocks after that. Any questions so far? And let me check. Um, let me check YouTube too. Okay, no questions. Fantastic. Okay, so here is. Let's get this shared. Okay, so here's here's Bitcoin, and we have a lot of Landry light once again. In fact, uh, I like the way it looks in ACP. So let's take a look at it over there. Okay, so here's the here's Bitcoin and ACP. You can see lots and lots of Landry light. It pulled back to the moving average, consolidated, and it broke out again. So I'm still bullish on Bitcoin because it's going up, okay? And Bitcoin is the big daddy, right? And it tends to help to obviously lift the other boats. So let's take a look at Ethereum. Now, Ethereum really, really took off on this, this ETF thing. I don't know why it outperformed Bitcoin, but Bitcoin usually or has in general for quite some time outperformed Bitcoin. So if you looked at Ethereum versus Bitcoin, you could see that Bitcoin has been much, much stronger up until the last few days. So this is kind of an interesting thing to look at. I like to look at that when I'm doing this. But anyway... So here is the, what was the one? Uh, was it ENS? Okay, so this one actually turns green now. So green means I hit the initial profit target, okay? Red means I haven't hit the IPT just yet. I may have gotten out of, this one might be a good example of one that it was breaking out, but then it came back in a little bit. So I may have exited this one. I don't know if it's still on or not. I'll have to check. But all these other ones are free rolls, so to speak. And you can see in this case here, I got in back here. IPT was here, and then I'm going to trail a stop on the remainder. TIA, this one was entered at three bucks a share. It's trading at 16 and change, which is nice. Knock on wood. SOL hit the IPT, it's just kind of consolidating. This one hit the IPT, just kind of chopping around. So, kind of dead money, but until and unless the crypto market really takes off, I'm not going to worry about those dead money positions. Another one is kind of dead money. You can see just consolidating in here, but it's a free roll position. So the ultimate goal is to get into these things, get my initial profit target out, and then hang on through a few of these corrections. And hopefully, I know you said hope, but hopefully they go a long, long way. So when you're playing the relative strength game, again, just sort by the percent change. And the only issue is that trading view, which I use for this RS stuff, rolls over early in the night, right before I start my show. So you're not seeing the, the true moves for the day. So if you are scanning about this time at night, you want to make sure you go through most all of your pairs if you're going to sort by your strength, just, just so you see the strongest ones. But anyway, I'm looking for a pair that's up toward the top. I use candles in this particular case, not for the actual patterns, but just so I could see the charts and see what they're doing. And I like to buy when they're at the top of their candle. Now, does anyone have any any pairs you want to look at before we shift gears and go to stocks? Hope you said hope. Yeah, I said hope. <laughs> Got to watch that. There's a uh, there's no hope. 
All right, let me get uh, stocks queued up, and we can always bounce back to crypto if you have any questions about that. So let's go over to here. Okay. Uh, let's take a look. This is the this is the open service portfolio. I am long all of these stocks for what it's worth. All of them are college fund worthy. <laughs> I'm gonna get in trouble saying that. Uh, no, uh, buyer beware. Somebody's gonna, cause I, I cause I'll say, uh, I jokingly say, mortgage your house and put all your money in, and then one day I'm gonna get in a lot of trouble. All right, S&P 500, kind of a wacky day, outside day today, a, a little bit of a lap higher, but then it came back in really hard and then bounced back by the end of the day. It's just a strange day in general. While we're down here, just real quick. The uranium, the physical uranium, actually banged out some new highs today. So we could see some setups here fairly soon in that area. NASDAQ Composite gapped open, sold off hard, but did recover to close in Flatsville, as you can see. These indices, specifically NASDAQ and the S&P, are rallying out of this little pullback in here. I would feel a lot better if they took out this prior little peak with vigor. S&P is pretty close to all-time highs. NASDAQ has a little further to go. If you take a look at the Rusty, Rusty so far is just pulling back in here from this nice little uptrend. Unfortunately, as I've been saying, a nausea, it's got its work cut out for it because there's a lot of overhead supply. Uh, today, as you probably know, the ETF, the spot ETFs were approved, and you can see that the market just absolutely blasted higher. This is GBTC. Has this converted? I think it, they, they've already converted these to, to an ETF. But anyway, this is the spot Bitcoin. I guess it might be the de facto spot Bitcoin ETF. Maybe not um, after everybody in that brother launches one. I think there's 11 that came out uh, or are going to be launched soon. But anyway, nice gap higher, shot higher, but came back in by the end of the day. But still, pretty serious uptrend. There. Uh, anybody know what the premium is right now or discount? Uh, I guess it'd be a discount still. This thing actually traded a premium at one point in time, and then it actually traded at like a 40% discount. Getting back to stocks, energies are just choppy all over the place. So I'll probably stop talking talking about them so much unless we break down or break out. There's nothing to do in that market right now. Metals and mining, speaking of breaking out, they broke out of this wide and loose range, but unfortunately came right back in. They don't look horrible just yet, but I'd, I'd avoid them for now unless they could show some signs of rallying. The good news is most areas are still looking pretty good in here. There's financials, kind of a trend pivot pullback. They've been on a tear as of late, only pull back a little bit. By the way, if you want to start asking about individual stocks, do so now. If you don't, if there's anything you want me to take a look at for you. I know we take a look at stocks often in Facebook, so we won't get as many tonight until we get some new people in. Anyway, drugs, nice uptrend so far, just kind of pulling back in here. Kind of a reoccurring theme. Biotechnology, nice uptrend so far. Again, just pulling back a little bit. List goes on and on. MNC, you can see just off of these all time highs, material construction. So, a lot of areas still look pretty good in here. Manufacturing just kind of pulled back. Defense, you can see it's just kind of pulled back in here. It's losing a little steam, but so far it looks pretty good longer term. Software actually banged out all time highs today, so that's kind of cool. Take a look at the semiconductors trying to rally out of a pullback. So they look okay. SMH just hit all time highs. It too rallying out of a pullback. I'd like to see these semis and some of these other areas make make it out of uh, what about the H O U T H I's? What's that? What about the who healthy? What is what is that, Greg? <laughs> semis set up as a short. Can it be? Um, not just yet. I hear you. Uh, it does have a little bit of a gatekeeper look. A gatekeeper is where a market sells off hard and stalls out prior to its prior highs in here. But um, I wouldn't call them down or now just yet. I'd give them the benefit of the doubt for now. What's a Houthi? <laughs> just but what about the Houthi? H O U T H I. What's that? All right. What else is going on in here? Uh, semiconductors. We can't. We've got to beat the dead horse on that. Retail's been doing pretty good lately. Retail is making these multi-year highs, not quite all-time highs, but so far, so good. What else? I think that's pretty much it for the market. All right, any individual stocks you guys want to look at real quick? And uh, while I'm waiting, 
let me check on um let me check on my brethren over in youtube you guys have any questions in youtube i know there's a lot of delay but let me know if you have any questions live chat okay all right all right going once no setups wow quite a bunch of them all right going twice <laughs> well i'm sure i thank everybody for attending tonight i appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule again anything on answer david dave landry.com leave me a comment on youtube if you're watching i do read and answer all when they require an answer uh to everyone here that's in facebook i'll see you tomorrow and then everybody else i'll see you next week thank you so much oh we're getting now everybody's all right let's take a look at some stocks everybody's gonna everybody's gonna have left by now and think that uh <laughs> no stocks uh yeah nvidia nvidia is not set up okay nvidia's gonna have to set up on a pullback so yeah it's broken out wait for it to pull back if everything in the world was going straight up then yeah buy something like that's going straight up bhvn yeah this looks really good keith um longer term though it's got some issues i'd find out what's going on back here but this looks pretty good but longer term there's some kind of there's some sort of issues and remember, markets have very long memories. If this is true trading, so you're going to have to do a research, I would just probably pass because it's not the best looking setup in the world. It needs a little deeper pullback. It looks okay, but I would pass based on all this fluff back here, unless you want to go in and do the research and check some other sources. But markets have very long memories. If this truly is a big gap down, then people are going to be looking to get out as it rises. So I'd leave that one alone. All right, again, thanks everybody for watching and may the trend be with you.